Ah. Oh. Good morning, Saddleback. Winging in from the great white north, bringing buckets of snow and Christmas greetings from Canada to you all under your palm trees here. It was a delight and an honor last night to walk through your light of the world and just to watch how you are reaching out to your community and being a beacon here. You as the light of the world here really are a light to the church about how to love people well. So just thank you, an absolute honor and privilege to be here. I bring earnest prayers and much love from my family at home. I actually FaceTimed my husband in between services. He said, things must be going really well at Saddleback, Anne, because everything that is possible could have broken down and gone wrong here. We are under a terrible attack. So I think things must be going really well where you are. <laughs> So, sending much love and prayers. This is my family. Um, I call my husband all the time my farmer husband. When I spoke in Australia at Hillsong for two days, I kept referring to him as my farmer husband. And when the women, these lovely Aussie women, explained to me, they were hearing my former husband. <laughs> no, he's not my former husband. We are still happily married in 27 years. Um, we have seven kids ranged in age from 26 down to seven. Caleb on the end just got married to a fine Colorado girl in September. Um, Levi and Hope, they both had their birthdays yesterday, December 11th, a long time. They thought they were twins. and no, actually there's two years apart between the two of them. Shiloh's in her papa's arms. Standing beside me is our second born, Joshua. And then um, Shalom. And then Malachi there on the end who would really love you to pray for him. He's at five foot, three inches and a quarter. And if he could just, or three quarters, if he get one more quarter, he could say he's six foot six is what he'd really like to be. <laughs> um, Levi is our photographer. He just set up a tripod to take that picture in my dad's event barn after a birthday party. Dad had built that barn with his own two hands up from the ground. He'd taken down one barn um, and moved that barn from the 1800s into town, raised it again, and then um, built a stone loft, stone upon stone upon stone. And he called that stone loft of the barn where you saw us taking the picture, Amy's loft. He actually had Amy's loft engraved in stone, um, steel and put up on the stone wall there. Amy, who is my younger sister and my dad's second born daughter. Amy, who at 18 months of age, was um, walking across our farmyard at home. Um, it was just after my fourth birthday. I was standing on a chair at the kitchen sink beside my mama washing dishes. We were looking out the farmhouse window and we watched um, Lamy toddle across the farmyard after a cat in a service truck that was not supposed to be there. I'd come in the yard and didn't see her and we witnessed her fall underneath the tires of the truck and be crushed and killed. Um, that traumatic accident profoundly formed and shaped our family. Um, all during my elementary years, my mom was in and out of locked psych wards trying to process the trauma and the grief and the guilt of that farm accident. And my dad, um, to process the grief, he became a workaholic just to try to escape and numb from the pain. And for me as a little kid, it really was my first memory. And the world seemed like a terrifying place for me. And by the time I was in grade two, I was um, hospitalized for ulcers, fear just kind of eating my gut up from the inside out. By the time I was a teenager, I was cutting to try to escape and release the pain. And by the time I got to university, I was diagnosed with um, panic attacks and agoraphobia. Um, agoraphobia, the definition of agoraphobia is to be fearful and try to avoid places where escape might be impossible. Sort of like being on a stage <laughs> at Saddleback right now. <laughs> God has a wild, crazy sense of humor. <laughs> Oh, but your K, your K, Warren, has loved me so well the last year. Because this, this past April, about two years after that family photograph was taken in my dad's barn, 
And dad had come up to Daryl and I after that photograph had been taken. And he had said to us, I hope you know, Anne, how lucky you are. I thought, oh, dad, no family looks lucky, hasn't experienced great loss. No family looks like they've received grace upon grace without also experiencing grief upon grief. You can look like you've received all kinds of blessings, but we're all carrying all kinds of heartbreak. And this past April, in that same farmyard, my dad was crushed and killed under the wheels of a farm tractor. Lucky. to have both your father and your sister killed the same way, in the same place. I have felt anything but lucky. Maybe, maybe this Christmas you too have put up your Christmas tree. You have all the lights dancing, beautiful. But you don't feel like one of the lucky ones. You're sitting there with all kinds of loss that you're processing and questions and doubts and grief. And everybody else is just cranking up the Christmas tunes. And here we are in Advent. Latin, it means coming. The coming of Christ. Season just before Christmas. And this is the third Sunday of Advent, known as Godote, Godate Sunday. In Latin, Godate means rejoice. We light that third candle of our Advent race, the joy candle. Maybe you're sitting here this Sunday and you're thinking, yeah, I don't know what joy looks like this year. How do I rejoice? After the season, the couple of last years, we've all had to endure and come through. The people we've lost, the dreams we've lost. When you open the pages of scripture to read of Jesus coming, at first advent, before you ever read of the birth of Jesus, you read of the genealogy of Jesus. So that's been our family tradition for the last 20 years. We, we put up the Christmas tree, and then the beginning of every December, we start to read, starting in Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament, to read the family tree of Jesus, the high points all the way through the Old Testament. That's why I wrote The Greatest Gift and the children's edition, Unwrapping the Greatest Gift and The Wonder of the Greatest Gift. So that, I mean, our kids would get so excited that they knew that in December, every year, we were going to really cover the whole expanse of the Old Testament, hitting those high points of the love story of Jesus coming for us from the beginning of time, his family tree. And they take those little ornaments, there's ornaments for each of those family stories throughout the scripture, those biblical ornaments, and hang them on the tree. So when we got to Christmas Day, the whole of our Christmas tree would tell the gospel story from the very beginning. Those ornaments are available as a free download at thegreatestchristmas.com. So the Christmas tree is telling Jesus' story. So when we look at the family tree of Jesus, the genealogy of Jesus, if if you don't come to your Christmas tree through Christ's family tree, it can be hard to understand the meaning of Jesus' coming. Because without the genealogy of Christ, the family tree of Christ, the limbs of his past, the branches of his family, the love story of his heart for you, how does our Christmas, how do our Christmas trees, how do we still stand? Without looking at the family tree of Jesus, it kind of shears the roots of our Christmas trees and the meaning. You can miss the full miracle of Christ's coming. Because 
in the time of prophets and kings, in the time of Mary and Joseph, in the time Jesus was born, it wasn't, it wasn't your line of work. It wasn't your line of credit. It wasn't your line of accomplishments that explained who you were, that gave you your identity. It was your family that gave you your identity. It was your family that gave you context, that explained who you were, where you came from. And if we want to come to the Christmas tree and receive the gift of knowing who we really are, we need to know the family tree of Jesus and if and where we belong in that family tree. When you look at the family tree of Jesus, the coming of Christ, it's right through the family of, of messed up monarchs and battling brothers. The family tree of Jesus has adultery and affairs, more than a skeleton in two in some closets, dysfunctional families with all kinds of feuds. Open up the genealogy of Jesus' family tree there in Matthew and Luke. And Jesus' family tree doesn't look like a lucky family. But it is murderers and abusers. And it names the powerless and the oppressed and the marginalized and the messy, the used and the forgotten, the foreigners and the outsiders, the deeply hurting. You sit at the foot of your Christmas tree and you look at your family tree and look at Jesus' family tree you know that whatever kind of family you come from is the kind of family that Jesus comes from and is the kind of family that Jesus comes for. Jesus' genealogy there in, in Matthew. Foreigner, check. Outsider, check. Marginalized, check. Grieving, check. Limping, wounded, Scarred, check, check, check. The family tree of Jesus reflects all of humanity. Christmas is for everyone because everyone is reflected in Christ's family tree. It was in the time of prophets and kings, the time of Mary and Joseph, the time when Christ was born, that men were in genealogies and women were invisible. But in Christ's family tree, it's startling to note that not one woman, but beyond Mary, four other women are named in Christ's family tree. Women who were foreigners. Women who felt like outsiders, who have been, never been. Women who were weary of being taken advantage of objectified, not seen, not valued. But Jesus, Jesus claims exactly those who are wandering and wondering and weary and worn out as his. The heartbreaking family lineage of Jesus throws a lifeline to all of our heartbroken families. Whatever kind of family you came from is whatever kind, is exactly the kind of family that Jesus came from, exactly the kind of Jesus family that Jesus came for. I mean, there it is in Matthew. We'll read. This is the genealogy of Jesus of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Jacob and his brothers. You know that story, Genesis 37 to 50. Jacob, he loves his son, Joseph. And he has this beautiful coat, this tapestry of many colors. He gives it to his son, Joseph. And all of Joseph's brothers, Jacob's sons, hate him for it. You know any families where there's one favored one above all the rest? And Joseph's brothers, they, they, they take his robe. They kill a goat. They dip the hem in blood. They take it back to their father, Jacob, and they say, look, look what happened to, to Joseph's robe. Do, do, do you know where he is? What's happened? Hmm. You know, any families where there's manipulation that's happening. And Jacob, he looks at this robe and he says, it's Joseph's robe. 
wild animal must have eaten him and, and torn my son to pieces. And all the brothers go, yeah, yeah. You know any families where there's lying and secrecy? Jacob's sons, Joseph's brothers, they sell Joseph, traffic their brother down into Egypt. And after Jacob has died, Joseph's brothers become very fearful. They say, now, now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him. You know any families that are trying to pay each other back for the pain they've caused each other? But Joseph replies to his brothers, do not be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. Whatever you have come through in the last year, Whatever was intended to tear you apart, God intends to use that to set you apart for him. Whatever has just about torn you apart, God can use that like to tear back a veil, make it a thin place so you can see more of the glory of him. Whatever happens, Whatever unfolds, whatever unravels, in Christ, we can never be undone. You can stand around a Christmas tree with a family tree, a bit like Jacob's family, with cheaters and beaters and deceivers, a family that ran away, ran around, ran lots of people down into the ground. But out of a family line that looks like a mess, God brings a Messiah hear God speaking to us this morning, no matter what was intended to harm us, God's arms have us, hold us. No matter what was intended to harm us, our God is not distant. Our God is not powerlessly impotent. Our God is not absent. And you, you have not run out of hope. You have not run out of second chances and fresh mercy and new starts. You have not run out of the possibility of experiencing real joy because, because you can know this Christmas you are going to make it because you have a maker who has come for you. Amen? Amen. You have a maker who has come for you. You are going to make it. In the middle of all of our collective messy family trees and propped up Christmas trees stands the most monstrous evil of all of history, the tree of Calvary. The holy dark over the manger, it's going to give way to the heinous dark of the Messiah hanging on the cross at Calvary. And the created, the made, us murdering the creator, the maker. But our God, our God takes this, the greatest evil ever known to all of humanity and makes it into the greatest gift we have ever known to literally save us from the pit we could never get ourselves out of. If our God can transfigure the greatest evil into the greatest gift then he intends to turn whatever you're experiencing, even that, into a gift. Wherever you're at, whatever has happened, whatever you're processing right now in your life, you can hope against hope this Christmas. Which means you can take your hope and let it only be supported by hope. You can take your hope 
and lean it all up against hope himself. And let Jesus take the weight of all of your ache and all of your grief and all of your heartbreak and let him alone be all of your hope. This Christmas, you get to hope against hope. The heartbreaking family lineage of Jesus throws a lifeline of hope to all our heartbroken families. Whatever family you come from is the kind of family Jesus came from and the kind of family Jesus comes for. From your family to Jacob and Joseph's messed up dysfunctional family to Joshua who is leading the family of God into the promised land. And he, he sends out spies. And those spies, they come to the house of a prostitute named Rahab. And they stay there that night. And scripture reads, Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. I know the Lord has given you this land. She told them, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Before they left, the men told her if she wanted to be saved when they entered the land. When we come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members your father, your mother, your sister, your brothers, all your relatives must be here inside this house. I accept your terms, she replied. And she sent them their way, on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. Here's Rahab. She's, she's got a line of men waiting at her door for a piece of her. She's living in a town where no lines of God are ever read. There is no prophet that's going to show up and say there's a coming visitation from heaven. She's one woman with the grime of many nights on her hands, the weight of all kinds of wounds on her heart. A woman who looks up in her mess and sees the tenderness of God. In a place of faithlessness and doubtfulness, and godlessness, God can reveal himself wherever and whenever to whomever. I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope this Christmas that God can reveal himself in places like that. God who is never limited by lack or restricted by the expected God who is no respecter of persons, but relentlessly pursues the prodigals, God gives the greatest gift of faith exactly in the places you most doubt. Here on Godete Sunday, the Sunday of rejoicing in Advent, that is always the secret to joy. To believe that God is where you doubt he is. Where in your life right now do you doubt that God really is? Do you have great faith, great hope to believe that God is showing up, that God is at work right there in that place? Here's Rahab. In a godless place with a godless past, she steps out not in strong competence, but in surrendered faith. She steps out in great hope. Rahab, the scarlet woman, flings that scarlet cord out her window. That one thread that everything is hanging on. And that's, that scarlet cord, that's her identity. That's her name that claims her. It's that scarlet line that's running right from the Garden of Eden and the animal sacrifice that covered Adam and Eve. That scarlet cord that runs on to the Passover and the crimson blood that is put on the door frames that the angel of death might pass over the family of God. That scarlet cord that runs on to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is bent, sweating great drops of blood drinking that cup of suffering 
for you because he loves you so much. That scarlet cord that continues on to Calvary, where Jesus goes to the cross, stretches his arms out so wide to receive anyone who is willing to come. Rahab is delivered by that singular scarlet cord and tied in to the Jewish family. Just like every single one of us who take that scarlet cord is tied in to the family of God. Here's Rahab, a former woman of the night. God takes her because of her great hope and her great faith. And she ends up marrying a Jewish prince. The woman of the night becomes a woman of the court. She marries Prince Solomon and they have a son. The son's name is Boaz. Boaz, who marries Ruth. The other woman named in the family lineage of Jesus. Ruth and Boaz, they have a son named Obed. Obed has a son named Jesse. Jesse has a son named David. King David, our Rahab, is the great, great grandmother of King David himself. This Rahab who was a prostitute, this Rahab who was a pagan, she's only the second woman named in that great hall of faith in Hebrews 11, along with the great fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, and Moses. This is what scripture says of her. By faith, by having great hope, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. Rahab, right there in the family tree of Jesus, her life bears testimony. Great faith, great hope. Great faith is the great equalizer, the greatest eraser and the greatest definer of who we are. This Christmas, where is your great faith in the work and ways of God? Where is your great hope that God is working in ways that you don't even realize or see that he's working? By faith, Rahab The Puritan theologian John Owen says, Rahab stands as a blessed example, both of the sovereignty of God's grace and its power. Nobody, no sin should lead to despair when the cure of God's sovereign almighty grace is engaged, end quote. Nobody and no situation, no sin, no decision, no mess, meets the diagnosis of despair. I don't know what you're facing, but for me, that's kind of everything right there. No situation faces the diagnosis of his any despair because we have the cure of God's amazing grace. Amen? Amen. God's amazing grace cures all of our situations so nothing meets the diagnosis of despair. No personal choice that has muddied your life or the life of someone you love can trump God's divine choice to wash that life, that heart clean. No situation, no situation is more hopeless than our Savior is graceful. I don't know about you, but that makes my heart kind of explode with joy. No situation is more hopeless than our Savior is graceful. That scarlet red cord that Rahab threw out her window In Hebrew, the word for that cord, it's tikva. That's a red cord man, tikva. But also the same word in Hebrew for hope. 
you can wrap up all of your Christmas presents with red ribbons for all of your people. And trust that there is one scarlet lifeline of hope for all of us in this tangled, knotted, messed up world. And it is the scarlet lifeline of Christ himself, our only hope. We get to hope against hope this Christmas. God who hung the stars in space, he has taken a red thread of his heart and tied it to our hearts. The hopeful family lineage of Jesus throws a lifeline of hope to all of our families. Maybe, maybe you're looking at your family tree, at the messed up family tree of Jacob and Joseph, the brothers who had betrayed each other. I mean, trusting God's gonna take what other, meant, other people meant to harm me. God's gonna use it for good. God's arms have me. You're looking at the story of Rahab and those other four women in Jesus' family tree, Bathsheba. Tamar, Ruth, women who are outsiders, who've been abused and used. And maybe you end up a little bit like the prophet Habakkuk, who is speaking to the family of God, prophesying to the family of God when they are far away from home, when they are in exile long before their liberation and return to Jerusalem. Habakkuk goes up on that watchtower. He looks out at the landscape of things. Maybe you're like that, looking at the landscape of your life this Christmas. And your heart kind of beats with Habakkuk's heart, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vine. This farmer's wife knows what it's like when the, when the crop did not yield. And where is our life? Could, you know, all of the, everything that we need for the next year was caught up in that harvest that isn't now. Even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the field, and the cattle barns are empty. But can you say it still with Habakkuk? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. Habakkuk 3. You could say for many of us, I know for me this year, putting up a Christmas tree, it's felt like the Christmas tree does not blossom. And everything has kind of crumbled away underneath your feet. I've been in a place where I thought if there's one more piece of bad news, if one more relationship cracks, if one more bad thing happens, can feel like the olive crop has failed. <laughs> and dreams have failed. And relationships have failed. And people have failed. You can look in the mirror and think, I have failed. I have so failed. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord, is what Habakkuk says. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. While we struggle in the now, we can still rejoice in the Lord right now. Because in the family of God, suffering and joy are not two chronological steps that come one after the other. Suffering and joy, they're two arteries of the same heart that is the heartbeat of everybody in the family of God. They're two concurrent fluid movements. You can feel deep suffering and deep joy at the same time. The cold of the storm 
can draw you closer and nearer to the warming love and heart of God. I can testify at the end of this year that deep suffering can deepen your joy in the Lord. How do we rejoice in the Lord? How do you find joy? Nitty gritty, really practical. Okay, track with me now. Joy is always a function of gratitude. Which means it is always, always, always possible to find joy in whatever situation you're in because it is always, always, always possible to find something to be thankful for. Something to be thankful for. More than 10 years ago now, um, I picked up a pen. A friend of mine had dared me. Could I write down a hundred things I was grateful for? And I'm the kind of girl, if you dare me, I'm going to write down a thousand things I'm grateful for. And I wrote down a thousand gifts. And it dramatically transformed my life. That fearful, agoraphobic woman who was cutting, I dare say, the act of picking up a pen and writing down a thousand gifts, it cured me of my fear. Because when you start to count all the ways God loves you, in every situation, he's providing provision upon provision. Count all the ways he loves you. And his perfect love drives out all fear, kicks all fear to the curb. You know that regardless of whatever situation you encounter, his grace and his love, his provision is always coming to meet you. After my dad was killed this spring, I made sure every single morning I sat down at my desk with my scripture open and I read God's word and I wrote down 10, 15, 25 things a day, every single day that I was grateful for. The reason God tells us to give thanks in everything is because he knows if we can give thanks in everything, we can live through anything. The joy of the Lord is our what? Our strength. You let something steal your joy and you let something steal your strength. I'm begging you this Christmas, don't just go out and buy gifts. Make a promise to the Lord that you will pick up a pen this Christmas and start to write down gifts that you already have. That you will start to give thanks, give thanks, give thanks and have a posture of gratitude. It will radically transform your life. I mean, even the science says that if you write down three things a day that you're grateful for, you'll be 25% happier. Anybody want that gift this Christmas? Come on, it's for free. All you gotta do is pick up a pen. Seriously, nothing has more radically transformed my life. Give thanks to the Lord. Why? His love endures forever. And my problems, my grief, my heartbreak won't. It won't. <laughs> Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Causes us to be a people who can rejoice in anything. Because the answer to all kinds of anxiety. That little girl who was so afraid that your sister, the people you love could be killed in traumatic ways. That little girl with ulcers and who was cutting. She came to realize the answer to all kinds of anxiety is the thankful adoration of Christ who is with us always. Even now, even though, even though the fig tree doesn't blossom, 
And the Christmas tree and our family tree aches a bit. Even now, we will be joyful in the God of our salvation. Habakkuk, prophet to the family of God, he tells us to turn our focus. Tells us here on Gaudete Sunday, the rejoicing Sunday of Advent, the secret of joy is always a matter of focus. We get to choose what we focus on. Will we choose to focus on the fears or on the goodness and the gifts and the grace of God? And all fear is but the notion that God's love ends somewhere and we will end up beyond the loving arms of God. You count all the ways that he loves you. You begin to realize, I will never end up anywhere beyond the loving arms of God. About this time of year, we're going to hear it everywhere. Carolers singing exactly what those angels sang over the shepherds in the field. Fear not, for behold, we have a savior. Though we have pages in our story that we would do anything to go back and rip those pages out of the story. That we wake up some morning because, oh right, I'm still in this story that I don't want the story. The rock bottom reality is in all of our stories, there is this page. My favorite verse in all of scripture, Romans 8.32. One worth memorizing and branding right onto your heart. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give us all things that we need? If you've got that page in your story, doesn't matter what any of the other pages are, he will give you everything you need. If he didn't withhold his own heart from you, will he withhold any good thing that we need? He gave us Jesus. Need there be anything more? Jesus, he shattered the space between heaven and earth and came as a naked, breakable babe for you in a manger crush. And then he eventually lays his naked and bare back on that cross for us. If trust must be earned by God, and so many times I've lived like that, hasn't God unequivocally earned our trust by laying his back on the bark of Calvary's tree? with a wreath of thorns pressed on his brow, with all the wrongness and all the brokenness and all the sinfulness of all of history on his shoulders. And your name, your name on his cracked lips. He's already given us the most incomprehensible gift. He's given us his perfect heart and taken our broken hearts and has saved us, literally saved us. Jesus Christ is literally the only one who has ever loved you to death and back to the realest life through his love. I think that's worth praising him for this morning. That's us rejoicing on Godete Sunday. How will he withhold any good thing from us? When everything seems to give way underneath of us, and honestly this year it has felt like things, everything is given away under me after dad was killed and we had to process trauma that some mornings I didn't know how we are going to live through. And all kinds of unspoken broken in our messy family. But when everything gives way underneath of you, 
we fall into Christ's safe arms. For real. It is safe to trust. You can hope against hope this Christmas. When we feel too weak to go on, his strength is made perfect in our utter weakness. And his nail-pierced hands help us and hold us. It is safe to trust. You can hope against hope. And we can give thanks in everything, no matter what. Because God is always good. And we are always, always, always lavishly loved. And a good God will lead us through the mystery of suffering and gather up all the pieces and do the restoring and restoring and working all things together for good. It is safe to trust. You can hope against hope this Christmas. We are saved from hopelessness because God came with infant fists and opened wide his hand to take the iron sharp edge of our sins and our brokenness and our sadness and all the wrong things at the tree of Calvary. And instead of explaining to us the reason for our suffering, Jesus enters into the suffering with us, shares the suffering with us because he knows we think we think we want answers. We think we want explanations, but Jesus knows explanations can be cold. And he is the God who is with us and his arms are wide open and they are warm and they are forever and they hold us soul safe for always. Ache is not the last word for those of us who believe in the miraculous story of God. Jesus is, hope is, joy is. Right where you are this Christmas, at the foot of your Christmas tree, with your family tree, Jesus meets us with your name etched right into the palm of his hand. And he says, I'll graft you into my line. I'll graft you into my story. I'll graft you into my heart. And because of the cross, because of the tree at Calvary, he looks at your family tree and he gives you his name. He gives you his lineage. He gives you all of his rightness. It happens at the cross, the greatest gift, that great exchange. This, this is our story. This is our family tree. This is the truest love story. Your family tree is grafted into Christ's family tree. And whatever your story, you get to be restored and restoried. All of us this Christmas, we do not want a Christmas we can buy. We don't want a Christmas we can make. We want a Christmas that we can hold. A Christmas that holds us and revives us and renews us and remakes us. A Christmas that restores us and restores us a Christmas that whispers, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Christ comes right to your Christmas tree, looks at your family tree and says, I'm your God and I'm, I'm one of you. And I'll be your greatest gift. And I'll take you and remake you. Will you, will you take me? Take me, the God in the manger, who makes himself into bread for all of us who are soul-starved for joy. Take me, your God, who breathes stars in the dark and then waits patient like an embryo in a womb and delivers himself 
to free you. Take me, your God, who cradles galaxies in the palm of his hand. The highest heavens cannot contain him. And he folds himself into our skin. And he unfurls his newborn fingers in the cradle of a barn feeding trough. And we are saved from ourselves. We are saved from our brokenness and our sadness and our sinfulness and our loneliness because God is love and he can't stand to leave us by ourselves to ourselves. That, my friends, is the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is not that we can make peace, not that we can make love, not that we can make light, not that we can make gifts or make our families or our stories or our past or our future all perfect or right or make any of this busted and broken up old world save itself. The message of Christmas is that it's for everyone. The message of Christmas is that, that this world is a mess and we can never save ourselves from ourselves. And we need a Messiah. The family lineage of Jesus throws a lifeline to all of our families. Whatever family you come from is exactly the kind of family Jesus comes from that he comes for. You can hope against hope this Christmas and lean all of your hope up against hope himself. For unto us a child is born. The one and only greatest gift that we all need and that we all get to receive. Might you stand with me this morning, Saddleback, as we just go before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the throne of his grace. The one who is not only the greatest gift that we all get to receive, but gives us the great exchange at the cross. Lord Jesus, you know where we are at this Christmas season. The parts of our hearts that are, are hurting, Lord, the hidden places in our life where we are struggling at all to hope, Lord. And we confess, Lord, to you those places of hopelessness, those places of joylessness. Please, Lord, we ask you right now to touch those places with the reality of your presence. That no situation is more hopeless than you are graceful. Lord, if any of us have not taken the greatest gift of new life, a new heart, a new hope, the great exchange that happens at the cross where you give us all your rightness and take all of our wrongness. This Advent, Lord, this season we're waiting for your coming, we come to you, Lord, and we take you as our King and our Lord, and we bend the knee today and give you our whole hearts and receive you as the greatest gift who literally loved us to death. Back to the realest life, Lord. We thank you. We long to be a people of gratitude who thank you for coming from the kind of family that we come from to be the kind of family you come for. And today in the middle of our family stories, Lord, we lean all of our hope up against you, our only hope. We thank you that ache is not the last word in any of our stories, but joy in you, Jesus, is. Hear our cry, Lord, we don't want a Christmas we can buy or Christmas we can make or perform or perfect or purchase. We want a Christmas that is about the person of Jesus Christ. A Christmas that we can hold and that holds us and remakes us and revives us and restores and restores us, Lord. A Christmas that whispers to you, Jesus, because you alone are our greatest gift. We want to be the people that walk out of here and not just buy gifts, Lord, 
but the kind of people who keep writing down all of your gifts. Keep counting the ways that you love us. We might be able to say at the very end of our lives, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have always been good, Lord, and we have always been loved. Make us the people, Lord, who never stop giving thanks, and we are the people who can rejoice and rejoice and rejoice. And all God's people, whose hearts were filled with joy, said, Amen. Merry Christmas, Saddleback. <laughs>